Hey guys, welcome back to DigiViews, where we digitally interview icons in the design industry, giving you a better view of what being a designer really means. <laughs> Hi guys, and welcome. Today we're going to be interviewing Zan on digital trends in the design industry and her experience being a designer in the design industry. Um, Zan, would you like to introduce Oh, of course. Hello everyone, I'm Zoran and I'm currently a full-time lecturer at Inkscape Salambosh in the digital design and technology industry, but I've also gained experience in freelancing for graphic design, um, working in an art gallery, um, art museums and um, yeah, teaching in the design sector for quite some time. So, yeah, very excited to be here. Zoran, what is your go-to Adobe platform? Uh, my first choice is Photoshop, okay. and then the second one would be Illustrator. If you had, if all your designs had to have one color in them, what color would it be? Yellow. <laughs> and would you rather have a private client or a corporate client? Yes. I want to say private, but if you work privately with someone, then there's a lot more chance for like one-on-one -on -one criticism. So, in that regard, I don't know. <laughs> I could be a bit young, but I don't know. <laughs> what is your favorite tool to use in Photoshop? It would be either the lasso tool or the masking clipping mask. And a tool you wish exists on Photoshop? <laughs> yes. A very, 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 very advanced version of the object selection tool. So, if I were to have oh. like a photograph of a person, and their hair would just be automatically yeah. selected. If that would be done perfectly, that would be all great. Yeah. Your so, yeah. <laughs> favorite font to use in a design? Or body font, um, it would be a future uh, light. Um, how would you describe the nature of the design industry kind? liberating in a sense to be able to be creative and to be paid for it um, but it's also extremely competitive so if you don't necessarily have your own personal style or like an established designer in whichever industry it might be very challenging to get to a certain level um, but yeah it's extremely fulfilling but the industry itself is challenging and it's very competitive there are two sides to it, but it's both of those sides are very prevalent. Um, and then, have there been any shifts in the digitalization, um, like digital trends, that kind of stuff that you've noticed since you joined the industry? I have to say, since I've been, I mean, I haven't been like in the industry for like 10 or 15 years, but since I've started working in it, I've seen quite a shift from everything being just digital to more incorporation of like handmade elements as well as digital work. So for example, um, one of my colleagues did her masters on how Instagram can be made more physical. So like physically encouraging your user to draw whilst in, um, being in contact with Instagram, for example. So there's more a connection between the dig digital and the physical side of designing. Um, so there's quite a cool collaboration between the two instead of the two being completely separate, yeah. which is really cool. Great. Okay, and what are your thoughts on like the extreme digitalization of the design industry? Like you said, everything went very digital. Um, what, how does that affect your work or influence your work? Adam? There are positive and negative sides to it, definitely. The digitalization, in the positive sense, it makes it a, it makes it possible for designers to work globally, so I could have a client in Canada and at the same time I could have a client in China and like in Bloemfontein. And we would be able to consult, I would be able to do work for them and not having to be in the same space as they are. Yes. However, in that sense, it does limit my capabilities to design for them because it makes my understanding of what they need a little bit limited because I don't live in their environment necessarily so that might have an impact and the, on the negative side um, you are limiting people who don't have access to digital programs to computers to adobe software all of those things um, if they are not able to 
if they've made a beautiful drawing but they can't scan it in and send it to someone, then you're limiting their capabilities to work in the industry. So there's like two sides and very positive but it can also affect designers in a very negative sense. Do you think that like the increased access to digital platforms when you are designing has affected the value of design like globally on all global contexts? Do you think that the value of design is affected by the fact that everyone has access to these Adobe platforms and that kind of stuff? One hundred percent. If I could give an example, um, I was asked or I heard about someone that's doing a logo um, development for a company and this person was an architect and like oh architects do logo development I didn't know that and then this architect told me that no I'm just going to input two different um, objects like a cat and a ball, ball of wool into a logo generator app and then I'm going to give this to the company as the logo and I got so offended because I was like, that is not how we do that. But in that sense, it most definitely affects the quality. You obviously still have people who maybe don't have design education necessarily, but they do have the inclinations to do it well. But anyone who has access can now design a logo. And that's not designing. That's just, just an excuse to make something. So definitely. Frustration. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, Amber, do you think that AI software has a positive or negative impact on the design industry? It does have an effect, most definitely. And up until this point, it doesn't seem like it's too positive. Um, specifically because AI draws on work that other artists have produced but it doesn't credit those artists mm. at all. So if AI were to generate imagery like from scratch essentially, by all means, but because it's only building on that which has already been made, but it's not giving the necessary credit, it's doing more damage than good at this point. Definitely. So you said that, that you've done a bit of freelance work mm -hmm. in your industry. So um, how do you get a deeper understanding of the people that you are working for, of their behavior and their needs? Like what is your process to really understand them? It would start very simply by having coffee with the person, like literally I had wine with the client and I had a coffee and I had water. And then the first session would usually just be like a discussion, like um, where are you from, what do you do, what, how old are your children, that type of thing. And then maybe towards the end of the discussion we would start with the actual work, but I not pride myself, but I feel like it's a more human-centered approach mm. to get to know your client instead of like from the get-go being like, what do you want, what can I do for you, how much am I going to get paid, yeah. something like that. Um, so it usually starts with more of a conversation and then I try to check in with them on the human level, like throughout mm -hmm. the process as well. And that really helps to understand who they are as a person, as opposed to just being a client. Mm. So what is your process of testing designs to make sure that it meets the end result that the client wants it? Trial and error and starting on time. Mm. <laughs> or preferably like ahead of time because it very often or it happens very often that you are busy with something and then you're going in a certain direction and you're liking it. And if you don't check in regularly mm -hmm. with your client, then right at the end, they may, they may be like, but this is not what yeah. I asked you to do. So that is worked into my work mantra, can you say? It's like a, um, I work on something, send it to the client, then they send their feedback, then I build on that. Very much like we do in school when you bounce your ideas off of your lecturer mm -hmm. constantly. So it's very much like that as well, to ensure that they are happy with what you're doing. And it's not at the end like, this is not what I asked you to yeah. do. <laughs> so, um, a big trend today is personalized content. So, mm -hmm. how do you achieve that personalized content for a specific client? Like, what's the steps to get there? Well, I mean, as I said, to spend time with them mm -hmm. as a person rather than just being a client, like off the mm -hmm. bat. But then it's also very important to get a sense of what they think good design is. Mm -hmm. um, like for example, I had a client who did, um, who I did a physiotherapy, like the um, branding for the business, 
And I had in my head like this kind of thing. And then when I sat down with her and I asked her to look on Pinterest and tell me what she wants her business to look like, it looked very different from the idea that I had. So in that way, it's almost like giving them the power or giving them like starting blocks to show me what they want because what I think something that should look like looks very different from them and essentially it's their end result that needs to be made. Mm. Um, so in that, in that sense it's personal in the way that they get to literally show me what they want um, and yeah, throughout the process it's just like a constant checking in like is this what you want so like mm-hmm. don't focus on what I'm telling you yeah. it's more of what do you want and how can I get that to you. So to end off, what is the three tips that you would give a designer who um, is in the industry now? The first tip would be to stick to your standards and if a client is maybe um, being harsh towards you or they're being disrespectful or they are trying to make you feel like your work is not up to standard, um, maybe it does happen that you don't spend enough time on something or whatever the case is but to just remember that you are also learning in the process it's not um, like you're not going to be perfect from the start your pro- your work is probably never going to be perfect mm-hmm. in that sense so i think to stick to your standards but also to remember that your standard it's gonna develop as you work more in the industry so that's the first one um second one is also to to not be too set on finding your style and sticking mm-hmm. to it. Like a lot of illustrators, for example, they have a certain style and then they work in that style for 10 or 15 years and then maybe after 15 years the world has seen enough of it and then they might not have work to do anymore. So stick to your style by all means, but try to like do other things on the side, like maybe try watercolour instead of just digital illustration or something like that. And that also allows you to broaden your horizons throughout the process. Um, and the third one, to, to continue to play. Honestly, it's very easy to get caught up in, I need to get, I have a deadline or I need to just get things finished. But in the process, you're kind of losing what you are passionate about. So literally taking time to just draw or to just throw paint on a wall, whatever it means to create a little mm-hmm. bit or to play and just get out of the working mode and into play mode, um, it's very important to incorporate that into your working schedule, I want to say. Yeah, I think that's all. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lana. I appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thank you for asking. <laughs>